Welcome everybody. I'm so pleased to introduce somebody that most of y'all know, I'm pretty sure. This is Rabbi Michael Gottlieb. He's the rabbi at Kehillat Marav Synagogue in Santa Monica. We just were able to be together on Thanksgiving morning doing our uh, annual Thanksgiving morning service. And it was lovely to be together. Even though it was via Zoom, we still even had the turkey song. So <laughs> Grace abounds and traditions continue no matter uh, where or <clears throat> how we're doing. We make it happen. So, uh, Michael, we're so glad that you're here. Thank you for being with us this morning. And welcome once again to our School of Christian Learning. Thank you, Reverend, Reverend East. And uh, Laura, it's just uh, with you and uh, Reverend Carpenter, it's and the church, of course. I mean, after it's all said and done, it's its constituents that is so endearing in the best sense of the word and uh, uh, truly godly and holy. I don't take these encounters lightly. I have no agenda other than, quite honestly, uh, really an approach that, that more often than not, uh, in fact, entirely often, uh, I walk away high and just... Uh, really with a sense of uh, commonality. And uh, I truly, truly uh, cherish these times together. Of course, this has been said to the point of utter redundancy, uh, infinitely preferable in each other's presence, um, but this is a, a distant second best being together virtually. Uh, so thank you, Laura. All right, I figure I'll start in this manner and I can only go up from here. So here we go. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright, co <laughs> bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with string. Okay, everyone, these are a few of my favorite things. All right, knock it off. Uh, like I said, I thought I'd start this way because if you start in the cellar, you can only go up from here, right? Uh, I, I don't treat text lightheartedly, but by the same token, uh, I, I have felt um, really after college and looking back retrospectively uh, that I lacked um, what I thought was a real sense of lightness and joy when I studied um, through years of college and graduate school and beyond. And uh, again, uh, always asking if had the opportunity, what would I do differently if I were in the seat of command, as it were, a teacher in a classroom? And uh, I think it's particularly true when studying religion, never, never to dumb it down. Uh, uh, you guys, I think some of you know me well enough. I like pop psychology. I don't like pop religion. Um, but by the same token, if there isn't a lightness, if there isn't a sense of joy, um, a, a, a real passion that, that draws with it a magnetism that we want to study more and enjoy what it is that we're studying, doesn't mean it's not challenging. It doesn't mean it's contradictory or paradoxical. Uh, then I think something's inherently missing in the religious enterprise. Uh, Laura, may I uh, shift to speaker view uh, just for the moment? Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, you can adjust your view however you'd like. All right. Uh, but I'm. Not, am I coming across as speaker view, or no? Yeah. No, uh, or because I see you, Laura, uh, uh, on the full screen. We see you just fine. You are fine. Yeah, you're uh, okay. fine. Okay, all right. So I don't know how I'm coming across, but uh, all right, be that as it may. Um, you should be able to change your view in the upper right. Right. Well, I don't know why I'm being locked out here, but uh, all right, anyway, forgive me, folks. All right, enough. Uh, in any event, uh, I, I thought with the spirit of um, more dialogue and also with, as I said, as a preamble, uh, a desire to have a certain lightness without uh, making folly, God forbid, 
of text or what I think is ultimately the gravitas of good religion of which no single religion has a monopoly. What I'd like to do is uh, go over some sections of the text. I'm gonna try to change this. Uh, go over some of the sections of the text that um, are resonant with me. And I hope that through some discussion, through some uh, uh, analysis of these texts, um, they can become uh, really a, a bedrock or an additional uh, collection within your arsenal of biblical quotes and inspiring thoughts, uh, always reassessing, always trying to um, squeeze out even more meaning without being tendentious. That is to say, have an a priori understanding of what it is that we want to achieve and then use the text to support it as opposed to trying to draw out from the text itself. So here we go. Um, a number of quotes in these are some of the uh, of my favorite uh, sections of the text. And uh, I want to also say, by way of a bit of a meandering introduction here, that uh, I have so many, as no doubt you have so many sections of the text. And this little class here, little in the sense of, of a brief class, um, can be series A, B, C, D, and so on down because almost and without hyperbole, uh, at almost every turn of the text, uh, I find certainly with an accumulation of life and years, uh, new insights, uh, new relevance, um, and uh, uh, new challenges as well. I wanna begin uh, at the beginning. So if you have a copy of uh, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, uh, or um, uh, a full Bible, um, uh, including the New Testament, I want to begin with Genesis. I want to also point out I'm using uh, one of um, my uh, beloved teachers and friend, uh, Richard Elliott, Dick Friedman's uh, commentary on the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament from Genesis to Deuteronomy. And remember, uh, the names Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and the like comes from the Greek translation of the Bible, um, the Septuagint. But uh, within a Hebrew context, we call it the Torah. And the first book is Breshit. The names of the text, by and large, are given according to what is the salient word in an opening sentence. So uh, in English, beginning, um, and in Hebrew, breshit, and that's what we would refer to it as breshit, uh, from the Greek extract, which is more topical. That is to say the name of the book is um, derived from what at least the, the editors feel is the salient um, message of the text. I would challenge the name Genesis because very little is discussed about creation of the world. If I were to name this text using English now, I would call it family because it is so real and it, it discusses family in large measure throughout the first book of the five books of the Torah. Be that as it may, let's open up and let's look at chapter one, verse one. And I'm gonna read it in the Hebrew and then I want to open it up, not merely uh, to bait you, but to uh, indulge you and ask questions with regard to what is it and how is it that you interpret these first words that we often read or gloss over without perhaps not knowing um, uh, the full depth of, of anyone's lives around this, this uh, platform, uh, but very often just read it really as a segue to some other issue or message uh, in the text itself. So the opening lines of the Bible read as follows. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim. And I'm just gonna leave it right at that. So here, this is an interesting um, uh, 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 vocalization of a text, Bereshit. How do you guys interpret the first, and, and forget, you, you know Hebrew, you don't know Hebrew, it's irrelevant here, but, but what is the popular translation of the very first words of, of the Bible? Uh, and that includes the New Testament uh, with the Old Testament as a backdrop. 
Uh, how do you uh, uh, interpret the first, what, what does your English say? Uh, give me, uh, just someone raise your hand and, and uh, uh, give me a translation. In the beginning. <clears throat> in the beginning, correct? In the beginning, yeah. With direct article, and this is not a class in grammar, but that is the classic interpretation. And by the way, that's true within many uh, Jewish, uh, so-called Jewish translations of the Bible in the beginning with definite article. But that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew is bereshi. There is no definite article here. Now, I don't want to just, um, you know, split hairs here, uh, but it is significant as we go deeper into the text. And I think a truer translation, um, and, and, and here you'll find, if you read Robert Alter, you read some other um, uh, translations, this is Dick Friedman, in the beginning of God's creating. And, and it, it, in other words, the creation is the beginning, but there's no direct article. It's like a beginning God's creation. That's another interpretation. All right, I want to just put that in your data bank for a moment and just keep it hanging there. The verb that is used in the Hebrew is really quite revealing. It's bara. So again, you're a Hebrew speaker, you're not a Hebrew speaker. It's really, uh, it's relevant, but it's not necessary at this point. Bereshit bara Elohim. Bara is an unusual verb, and it applies only, only to God. Bara is only something that God can create, ex nihilo, as it were, long before Greek philosophy. God creates out of nothing. We do not. If you use the metaphor of a periodic table, the world is a periodic table, and how we as human beings manipulate our environment, uh, our chemical compounds, uh, the physical corporeal world, is determinant by us, but we are not creating ex nihilo. We are taking existent uh, form and we're shaping it in the manner that we want. So we create a desk or we develop eyeglasses, but all the material that goes into whatever corporeal physical thing that we build, that we develop is inherent to our world, to our surrounding. Not so with God, and the verb here, and that's where we go deeper into the text, applies singularly only to God. But without trying to dredge something out of nothing here, because I do think this opening verse is one of my favorite things, I think it's extraordinary, what is this verse shouting? What is it saying to all of us? Whether we are a believer, a skeptic, a Christian, a Jew, uh, whatever religious background or no religious background, what is this text saying? What is it saying to its reader? And, 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 and I'm going to leave it somewhat open at that. Come on, stream of consciousness. What do you think? In the beginning of God's creating the skies and the earth, the heavens, in the beginning of God's creating the universe, what is being said here? What theological statement is being laid forth? Before anything, God, God was. Uh, expand on that. For anything God was, I'm sorry, unless I mis misheard you. No, you didn't. It, it, to me, what I'm interpreting is that God was. There was nothing before God. Okay. God was. Good, good. Uh, good, excellent, and 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 and, and, I, and I'm not patronizing here. I, I, there, there's not one way of interpreting. I think that's it. I, all right, according to my aesthetic, the way I would read this, entirely in the ballpark. Absolutely. What else? Uh, God was. God is. God always will be. The the notion of infinity is mind numbing. Mind numbing. Uh, I, I, I don't know what the hell infinity is. I can't comprehend it. You've heard me say it before. If I draw a number line, I, I, I literally could draw it here on a piece of paper, and I tell you that there's an infinite number of points on that number line, that makes sense mathematically, right? Because you can divide, 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 divide forever. 
But once again, if I say, now let's go outside or let's look outside into the sky, I don't know about you, but my mind, like a calculator, goes on overflow. I don't know what it means. But God always was. That, that is axiomatic. God is present, and God will always be. I know I'm digressing here because I want to come back to this verse, but what is the one thing God cannot do? Die. Say it again. Die. Die. God cannot die. God is infinite. God is always. Yes. Okay. What else does this verse say? Come on. What What is it saying to you? We know started with God. Say it again, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> Everything that we humans know started with God. Good. Good. There is a beginning. The world is not an eternal same -ness. This is a crucible issue for religion of the West. And I'm not saying this in a holier than thou way. Look at us. We, we, you know, we Jew, we, we, we Christian, uh, we Muslim. Uh, it, 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 this is a foundational issue. And what is that foundational issue? There is linear time. This is very nuanced. I would argue this is particularly significant. Linear time. There is a beginning. And to delve a little bit deeper, we are not, my words, we are not an oops of the universe. <laughs> now, is this a faith statement? You bet it is a faith statement. Do I know for certain? No more than you do. I am actually... Happy may not be the word, but but there's a measure of contentment in the way that I craft the equation, the theological equation. I am content that we do not know for certainty that God exists. I am actually content, maybe more intellectually than emotionally, that we do not know for certain what will occur to us upon our demise. I think if we knew for certain, it would drive us nuts. And I think if we apply certitude with regard to what it is exactly that God wants of us, I think that tends to lead to fanatical behavior. And I believe that across the religious spectrum. So I am not immune from it, and I'm by no means above it. We don't know for certain. This is a faith statement. But this is a huge theological axiom. And I think we as religious consumers often ask the wrong question, not whether or not God exists, because we don't know. And it's good that we don't know for certain, for certain. But I think we need to reframe the question ever so differently. What is the significance of God in my life? Or you can put it in the reverse. What are the implications if there isn't a God in the universe, if there isn't a beginning, if we really are nothing more than an oops of the universe. Over an infinite expanse, again, I double down on that. I don't know what that means. An infinite expanse, inconceivable as that is, over an infinite period of time, and time is a human, con a human construct, Time is the formation of life. But over all those infinite coordinates, you know, poof, out comes cognitive thinking, opposable thumb, you know, certain proteins, amino acids come together, and wow, life appears on the planet. And the planet itself appears serendipitously. This is a huge preamble to everything else that follows. And it's interesting here that the word for God, um, Elohim, uh, as you know, there are different names for God in the universe. In the preamble of the Bible, the Old Testament, is the idea of God essentially long before 
uh, uh, Aristotelian thinking as an unmoved mover. God is a deistic figure. Do God creates the universe. But there is a start point. Call it the Big Bang. Call it something that sets really the, the whole process in motion. And the words of God, uh, the reference of God are, are deeply significant. As I said, the verb bara is unusual. It is only particular to the creation of God. If I said in Hebrew, you know, uh, I, I made these glasses, I would, uh, the verb I would use is uh, asiti mishkafayim. I made these glasses. I would not say barati mishkafayim. That verb is only, only applied. I keep emphasizing this because to read it in the text, it just shouts at you. Only applies to God and God alone. Questions, comments, uh, follow up on, on this section so far. For me, this is a very radical notion to translate this first sentence in the way that you do. If I understood it correctly, creation is identified in a possessive, as in God's creation. Is that how you interpreted it? I think that's in bounds. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think it's descriptive. Uh, but the, it, within that description, uh, possessive, yes. It, yeah, it's That's, God's universe, you, you, you bet, yeah. That is quite a departure from the way the traditional uh, English translation reads. And, that, and the reason I think it's a departure is because there is God's creation, and then there is the beginning. So that I agree with you entirely, this passage uh, requires the concession of God's pre-existence. I think you're stretching to say that it also uh, it also conveys that he uh, exists forever. I, I happen to think that there are other places in the text where that comes from, but I don't oh, think- oh, oh, no, I agree with you. And, yes. and, 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 and if you interpret, if, if, then I misspoke. No, I, I, it, it becomes axiomatic to a broader understanding of God, certainly within a Jewish context, and if I may be so bold, to the extent that I understand rudiments of Christianity, it applies there as well. Um, but no, that is not extracted from this verse. Okay, so I, I agree with you. That 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 it that is not where that supposition is is uh, laid forward. Uh, okay. Laid forth. When you when you take the definite article out of the original Hebrew, yes, does that imply that there are other creations? Well, it's interesting. There's, God, there's God's creation, right? And then is it possible that there are then, by implication, other creations? Because if there were not other creations, it'd be unnecessary to link God in the possessive with the act of creating. You see my point? Yeah, I absolutely see your point. But the answer is no. Um, okay. uh, it's creation in its entirety, uh, okay. as unimaginable as that is. Universe in, 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 in the most expansive, infinite, endless uh, 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 parameter, uh, 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 definition. Okay. You, you know, the thing for me is what it always boils down to is how do we define God? There are some people who define God as anthropomorphic and he's out someplace else. There are other people who define God as spirit or spiritual. There are other people who define God. There's so many different ways. And I think that basically, you know, we kind of beg the question because when we talk about in the beginning of God's creating, it, but there is no, there gives us no definition of God. We, we, I invent my God, how I define my God. And a lot of it obviously is from interpreting the way I interpret the Bible. Uh, I agree, but but the 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 color, if you will, of of God's now being anthropomorphic, um, you know, personality is developed as as we unfurl the text itself. This is an opening line, but what I'm saying is that this opening line is so pregnant with interpretation. It is so powerful that we often just. Uh, skip oh I, I I lament that we often skip over this is one of my favorite things starting at the gate but with regard to God you're right uh, I, listen it, it's true with regard to so many things God and morality are not 
in the ultimate sense subjective, but you and I, all of us live in the world of subjectivity. In, in, in a theoretical constructed manner, morality is not personal choice. I like X, you like Y. I prefer vanilla ice cream, you like strawberry ice cream. Um, it, it, it is not relative when tethered to an objective, transcendent, omni everything. But that's a theoretical and now theological supposition. So you're quite right. Um, God is interpreted on a personal level. I don't know how else we can. Listen, I say this as a Jew. I've always felt that there is tremendous merit in, in um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't even say reducing, that's pejorative, but, 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 but projecting uh, either the divinity of God through Jesus or uh, as you know, the supreme uh, child of God through Jesus because how else as a human being am I to relate to an omni infinite everything except on human terms? That's not a, a limitation necessarily. That's a human definition. It's a human dictate. That's how I relate to things. I live in a, a you know, multi-dimensional world where there's physical and spiritual, experiential, uh, uh, intellectual, emotional, and so on down the line. That's my access. But I could not agree with you more. Uh, uh, and and I, th I think we all agree. I mean, I, how I view God, by the way, and how you view God, I suspect is not static either. Uh, there are times where, much like uh, with any human emotion, you feel more in love, closer to, maybe more distant, estranged from, and so on down the line. Uh, anything else? Any other comments on this one? Yes, sir. Uh, as, a, as a story narrative, uh, it very quickly moves to, you know, we're going to talk about the earth. Because it says God creates the heavens and the earth. He, 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 he then goes on, he doesn't talk about the heavens at all. It's a storyteller. So he immediately moves to now the earth was formless. So pretty quickly, it, you know, it doesn't say there, that God did not uh, influence other celestial bodies or, or universes or cosmoses or whatever. But it just says, well, now we're going to talk about the earth. Yes. Yeah, right. But but it, but again, it doesn't exclude to the earlier comment. I, it, it, the 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 understanding here, uh, here, and I'm going to revert back to the the Hebrew eta shemayim the eta aretz. That's correct. Um, aretz is land. In other words, the earth, creation of the word, and shemayim is the cosmos. It's the the great unknown, the great infinite, the great expanse, as it were. Is this anthropocentric? Yeah. Uh, it does this does this exclude the possibility of life, intelligible life in the infinite expanse? No. Um, we we shouldn't be reading this as pseudoscience either. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's making a statement. There is a beginning. There's causality. We are not just a fluke of the universe. And, and universe in the broadest, unimaginably broadest sense of the word. Again, where one's mind simply goes on overflow, as it were. I love when we get into this. Um, it feels a little like analytic philosophy. Bertrand Russell and Ludwig von Wittgenstein, but only in the sense that I have the same little funny feeling in my head when I try to contemplate it. Um, we are reminded in the... Christian Bible that now we see as through a glass darkly, but then we shall see face to face. Yeah. So subjective and infinite, for one reason or another, God did not give us the capability of truly contemplating infinity. So this is really fun stuff. I, I love it as well. It, it, you mentioned uh, Bertram Russell. Um, There's a great quip by uh, Russell. He was asked, um, you know, uh, Professor Russell, uh, it, when you die and uh, you meet God, what will you say? And Russell was known as 
an atheist, but I would argue an atheist of a different sort from uh, Sam Harris. I happen to like Christopher Hitchens a great deal. I don't know if you've read Hitchens, um, but I think uh, many modern uh, day atheist intellectuals, which I, I actually have issues with because I, I don't find atheism particularly uh, wise um, any more than pure theism do I find wise. To know for certain there's a God and to know for certain there isn't a God uh, 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 strikes me as, as uh, marginally foolhardy and I mean no disrespect, but, but I, I, I don't know how to soften the blow other than to say it uh, 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 marginally foolhardy. So when I, uh, Russell uh, was asked, you know, Professor Russell, when you die and you meet God, what will you say to him? And uh, Bertram Russell says, well, you didn't give me enough reason or you didn't show me, you know, enough proof for your existence <laughs> while I was alive. Um, Russell was interesting, though, in that regard. As I said, I, I never read him thinking that he had a, an ax to grind, but that's an aside. Uh, any other comments? I just want to say that I really appreciate you bringing this conversation because it's something I struggle with all the time. So thank you. A lot, I've never really heard anyone else kind of bring this up to the point that you're bringing it up. Oh, it's out there. But but uh, thank you nonetheless. I, I, I got to tell you, you know, it, it, so I have, I am not exaggerating, uh, like a laundry list of, of some of my favorite things. Folks, it is almost 920, and we are just on the first three words of the text. Go! <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to pull the plug on this one. Let's move on. Um, ah, this is, I love this. I, I, I love it all. I, 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 it's interesting. So when I was in a rabbinic, a rabbinical school is rabbinics. Uh, so I mentioned Dick Friedman, who, 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 who I, 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 I know personally, I, I, I adore him. He's uh, one of my revered teachers. Um, and uh, Dick was at, at the same school I went to, at a Jewish Theological Seminary, and he was studying, uh, he's older than I. Uh, he's now, I think, uh, emeritus. I met him at, uh, in San Diego. He taught at UCSD. And uh, he, um, he would meet with me and about uh, four others, maybe five, at most a half a dozen of us, once a month and uh, for, uh, over uh, for about five years, uh, and it was it was it was incredible. We would talk uh, about um, a book he was writing. We would talk about uh, the text primarily. It was breezy, but there was always a tent post. There was always a structure. Uh, anyway, uh, Friedman tells the story. Um, by the way, he wrote the book. Who wrote the Bible? He wrote uh, the book, the Exodus. Um, I'm using his commentary as I as I speak to you. <laughs> so he told the story that when he was in rabbinical school, he, he was studying to be a rabbi. Uh, and he had maybe a year, uh, two years to go in the program before he graduated. And he essentially said, look, I don't want to study rabbinics. I want to study Bible. And he goes off and he gets a doctorate in Bible and he becomes a, a teacher of Bible, a professor of Bible. Uh, and I find as I uh, am now older, um, I, it, that resonates with me. I love Bible. I just love it. Um, I have a respect for rabbinics. I have a respect for Talmud. Uh, there is an inherent logic. There is a discipline to it. Um, but this, this, this just sends me uh, uh, whirling. I, 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 I hope you have a similar love for it as well. Um, all right, anyway, let's move on. Um, this I find is, is uh, all right, I'm gonna say this. I, I'm gonna say it ad nausea, you know, I, I just, uh, I, uh, I'm getting excited just thinking about it. All right, let's look at um, chapter one of, of Genesis, verse 27, folks. And I'll read it to you if, you if you don't have a text in front of you, or if someone has a text, read it. Chapter one, verse 27, this, this blows my socks off. It's an okay. ancient text that is so relevant. That's the other thing also. I'm sorry I'm blabbing here, but um, it's my prerogative. You know, I'm teaching the class here. Uh, in any event, though, um, 
uh, it, this, 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 I just don't understand by, by, you know, the, these aspiring young academics, those, uh, including my own delinquents, my, my kids, you know, all these Ivy league, uh, trained, uh, morons, but that's another story. All right. I'm, 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 I'm venting here. All right. Uh, in any event though, the Bible is so relevant you know, oh, it's inane, it's archaic, it's anachro it's not even anachronistic, it's just it's it's, it's shelve it. It's it's you know a literature that should just be hermetically sealed in time. I I I I I'm grandstanding here, but but I'm not sure I know a more eternal, a more relevant text. It is so talking to you, to me, uh, and it continually uh, has that dialogue with us. Okay, read uh verse 27. Okay, now, first of all, I have to tell you, I'm reading from the NRSV. Because oh, then forget it. I don't want to hear it. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Good. All right. Uh, what does this say, uh, my uh, my dear fellow uh, uh, or my co-religionist here? W why is this so important? And why aren't we shouting this from the rooftop, for God's sakes? Michael? Yo. If I can just pull back one verse to, to set that up for a huge interesting thing for Christians is let us create mankind, which mankind. for us, for those who... who <laughs> argued the trinity that's where we get that idea first and foremost from and there's just this idea which is huge in the christian faith that from the very beginning god was already in relationship with god's self with others but somehow there's more than just one when it starts i, I love it um dave you know me well enough i i i, I i've always said and i am so not pandering to you guys for god's sakes uh a, a christian interpretation is an entirely legitimate interpretation it's not a jewish one entirely legitimate uh, there there are it, it really is a prism you hold it up to light and you'll see different you know angles and different color um yeah no i i uh i i, I hear that and and i have nothing seriously does, nothing but respect does for judaism it talk about that us yeah uh different apologetics um what is it uh what is uh, uh the, the the notion of other gods is fairly prevalent throughout the the bible right. um, but that doesn't exclude nor does it eclipse uh, the singularity and the transcendent of uh, uh, God alone. That is the, what Hinduism um, uh, notion of other gods exists, but there's still one supreme God. Uh, it's often used too in terms of the royal we. How are we feeling today? You know, uh, I always found that patronizing. But anyway, you, know, you go to your doctor. So how are we feeling today? I don't know how you're feeling, but let me tell you how I'm feeling, right? Um, in any event, but uh, yes, uh, uh, it is addressed. And uh, if you do read someone like Dick, um, Dick Friedman, um, he, he, he's, he's, a, he's a critical scholar. So he'll talk about what was essentially the zeitgeist, uh, what was the interpretation uh, as best we can project back into time, but yet very much as it approached. Um, and significant too, but but that that translation of um, on twenty six, Vayomer Elohim Naase, uh, uh, shall we? Um, or it, 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 again, it's the collective. Uh, how are we to create uh, man uh, here, Adam, um, uh, B'tzal Meno, in our image, and so on. Um, Focusing uh, a point well taken and and uh, worthy. If you want, we can zero back uh, perhaps at another time. Um, not not today though. Um, and I'm not just kicking that ball uh, down the field, um, but uh, it's well worth uh, a deeper inquiry. Um, the notion that all human beings are made in God's image. Um, here again, the root, the verb bara. Uh, let me read the Hebrew. <coughs> Excuse me.
Vayivra Elohim et Adam Bitsalmo Bitsalem Elohim bara. Again, that verb bara. And that's important. And I'm not, I repeat, I double down, I triple down, not grandstanding on, on a picayune point. The verb applies solely and solely alone to our creator, to God. Uh, um, uh, so God uh, creates uh, human beings in his image, in the image of God, all of us are created. Why is this, it, by the way, if you want to, there's no chronological um, uh, exactitude here. That is to say the chronology sort of dips and dives, it comes and goes. But if you read the text from cover to cover in that chronological construct, this is at the beginning of the text. These are some of the ground rules. All human beings are made in God's image. This is a cry to say there are no children, none of a lesser God. It doesn't matter your zip code. It doesn't matter how many sheepskins are on your wall. Um, it doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter your sexual uh, orientation. It doesn't matter. All human beings are intrinsically holy because all human beings share that spark. But selim, selim is a beautiful word in Hebrew. It's almost um, um, uh, shadow. Everyone has the shadow of God in him or her. This is huge. You know, we talk about America's original sin of slavery, and I do think that was America's original sin. Um, but, but by the same token, as much as there were those who advocated for and wanted the uh, continuance of slavery, there were the counterbalance of religious individuals who did and do to this day uphold this one line. That's why it's one of my favorite things, all human beings. And, and this is really just a hit in the solar plexus. This is, this is big. Take yourself seriously, enjoy life, Feel as if the world at times is created for you and for you alone, but never forget you share the same cosmic, cosmic DNA as every other human being who has lived and will live. We are all B'nai Elohim. We are all bara, B'tselem Elohim. Uh, it, this, this, this sends me whirling. I don't know about you guys. you have any comments here? Is this the um, origin of other provisions in the Mosaic law that entreat Israel to be hospitable to strangers and treat strangers justly? One. And then two, how is it, if this is read as you do, the institution of slavery was so pre prevalent uh, throughout the region? Uh, throughout the world. Yeah. Throughout the world. Right, but, but certainly during these prehistoric and then historic times that are reported uh, later in the Torah? So in answer to your first question, no. Um, the notion of treating uh, hospitably those who are indigent, those who are uh, widows or orphans and so on, there are other texts directed to that. There's a certain elegance to the text. That is to say that um, uh, there's not um, redundancy. Um, and uh, while it can be applied here, it's not, it's not addressed uh, most centrally. Uh, look, um, here's a theological divide between what I would say um, normative Judaism, and again, uh, to the extent that I have uh, a growing familiarity with Christianity, normative Christianity. Um, rabbinic thought, based on the Bible, uh, does not hold that human beings are basically good. The difference, and here's where there's a theological divide, is that Jews do not hold we are born with some type of a, a theological taint. And again, I'm not saying that in a triumphal way, more as a descriptive way. Jews do not believe in original sin. Um, there's, there's proclivities, there's inclinations that we have. And the supposition is that human beings are not basically good. That is to say, we need to be socialized. We need to be taught. 
it's Lord of the Flies without a foundation, a moral compass, as it were, that can help drive and dictate our behavior. I am head over heels for my grandson. He's two years old. I, I love him so much more than all my children. Um, but I know, I know, uh, and, and I don't say this, uh, I just say this as the gift of being a parent. I, I understand that everyone chooses to have children. Circumstances prevent uh, everyone from uh, wanting or who want to have children uh, uh, from having children. So this, again, is not a holier-than-thou comment. But I see it even more clearly now that I'm older and I do see uh, a young, young child in our, in our life, how he needs to be taught. Um, children are innocent. Children are beautiful. Uh, children are pure. Uh, but they need to be taught. We need to be taught. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and I think that is more the over arc with regard to what I do think are issues within the human description that need either addressing or expunging uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, to desire to control another human being and to objectify another human being um, is, is something uh, we need to be vigilant not to do that. And we do that. I, I do that. And, and I, I try to catch myself. Um, uh, you know, what have you done for me lately? What can you do for me uh, in the future? Uh, so no to the first question and uh, uh, with regard to what is the archetypal nature of the human being? That's a theological statement as much as it is uh, a genetic, as much as it is a psychological, as much as it is a social uh, description. But when you say also, when you say also that there's a, there's a sense of ownership that comes with that statement, um, you know, one of the one of the interpretations of that comes straight from the way Jesus used it once. Uh, you know, when they asked him, "Is it lawful to pay taxes?" and he asks to see a coin, and he says, "Whose face, whose image is on the coin?" and they say, "Well, Caesar's." And they say, "He says, okay, well then, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. His image is on the coin, and give to God what belongs to God." And the sentence that's unsaid there is, oh, and by the way, the image of God is on you. So when you give to God what belongs to God, you're giving to God yourself. Right, it's beautiful. And, I have and, a more simplistic view of this whole thing. I look at the Bible as a written documentation of us putting down and writing our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. And so consequently, when I read, so God created humankind in his image, we're trying to relate to God. And how else can we relate to God than by what we see around us? And so I love this thing. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I, it's beautiful. But to me, it brings me close like this to God. Because if I, if I, if, if I'm in his image, then, you know, how much closer can you be? Well, I, I, no, again, agree on both of the comments that were made. I, I, beautiful. I, I, I don't have a monopoly on interpreting. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I see it as a way of saying, look, um, you know, a meritocracy is fine. Work, you know, strive, exert. Uh, you, your God-given free will, but never forget other human beings have the same intrinsic worth as you do, regardless, again, of, of their diplomas on the wall, of, of their bank accounts, of their zip code, of, of whatever criteria you want. Victor Frankl <coughs> um, uh, it was a, uh, uh, um, a neuropsychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor. Um, and in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, which I think is really an exceptional text, uh, he says something to the effect that there are only two races in the world, only two, two races. What are they? The decent and the indecent. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, to me, I zero back to the notion of all human beings are made but Salem Elohim. 
It doesn't mean kumbaya. That doesn't mean you have to agree or accept everything and everyone. But at its foundation, it mollifies the manner in which I hope, at least at the end of the day, we can think about each other and relate to one another. Um, these are things that are not just pulled out of thin air. This is a textual foundation. Now, to what extent, and this is an interesting question by itself, to what extent, A, do you think the Bible is divine? To what extent, B, do you think the, the Bible is binding? To what extent do you feel the Bible uh, should continue to contribute at least to the formation of Western civilization? I mean, to each his or her own. That's a very personal a string of questions. Um, I, 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 as a faith statement, I'm digressing ever so slightly. I actually do believe that uh, the first five books of the Bible are divine, not to be taken literally. This is my faith quotient, um, but I believe it contains the word of God. Uh, and, and I do think these are moral prescriptions for life. I can't tell you what to think. I can't tell you what to feel. But I can, not I personally, but as an enterprise, uh, can try to gear your behavior in a certain way, how to act, to challenge you how to act. Um, and, and with it, uh, the hope is that perhaps certain feelings will become commensurate with certain behaviors as well. Uh, it is interesting within the broad brushstroke of rabbinic of thought, the debate is, is raised and, and it rages on to this day. Is it better to behave predicated on one's heart or predicated on a sense of obligation that transcends one's emotion? And I think you can make a case for both. I don't think it's so cut and dried. I have an opinion, um, but I vacillate on that. I wish our hearts could motivate us, but I go back to the supposition that I, I, I shared with you a moment ago. Um, uh, Jewish tradition does not hold that human beings are intrinsically good, intrinsically holy. Uh, they need to be taught. We need to be socialized. Um, and again, that's into the deeper, uh, the weeds of the debate with regard to an original sin, an original taint. Uh, that's a theological divide. Other questions, comments on this very verse? Back to the verse. Um... Can you shed any further light on the meaning of image? Like, does God look like us? Or is it something more essential? Yeah, as I said, the word selam is, is image here. Um, in, the, in the verse before it, it says, um, <coughs> uh, hold on, hold on. Um, uh, ba -da -ba -da -da -da. Selmo. Uh, demut. Demut is similarity. Uh, Dome in Hebrew is similar to. So in the verse before, the one that uh, Reverend Carpenter commented on, and, and uh, again, the na'ase, shall we make man in our image? Um, selim is, as I said, uh, translated in part, not in total, as, as a shadow, uh, almost a, um, a projection of, no, nothing that's tangible, as it were. Um, but a uh, demut, uh, so it's betzel menu uh, ki demutenu. Uh, demut is a, a, a certain uh, similitude uh, to God. Um, but no, uh, these are uh, in well. Well, it's interesting. I shouldn't say no so 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 forcibly. There are great examples throughout uh, the Old Testament where. Um, the anthropomorphization of God is, is projected. You know, God is jealous. Uh, God gets angry. Uh, God is loving. Uh, these are human uh, manifestations projected on an omni-ethereal everything. Um, in this case, I think it's more intangible, though. I don't, I don't see this as... Uh, so while there are those examples in the Bible, I don't see this uh, tethered to that. Um, that. That's not how it would be interpreted. Uh, and when I say that's not how it would be interpreted, it's a bit presumptuous, but but I think it's still in all within the broader mainstream of how um, the mainstream Judaism would would, would apply uh, its its understanding to it. Is the redundancy in verse 27 
uh, also seen in the Hebrew, particularly the phrase in the English translation, he created them. In my translation, it's yes, yes. Both in the middle of the text and at yes. the conclusion. What? Yeah, that's accurate. Uh, uh, excuse me. I'm sounding like I'm above all this. It's accurate to the best of my understanding, yes. And so what is the what is the um, understanding we should draw from the author's intention in the redundancy? Well, one interpretation would be emphasis. Um, let me make this very clear, and let me tell you again, and let me uh, zero back and reemphasize what I just told you twice. Uh, it's emphasis. Yeah, by the way, you have other examples of that, and, and it may very well be, and, and this may be a bit reductionist, uh, a literary device. You have other examples of um, uh, uh, where, where you know, um, nouns are clustered or verbs are repeated, um, you know, uh, mut ya mu, uh, uh, mut, ya mut. You, you, you know, you, you will definitely die. You know, but but death is repeated twice, even though in in English in the vernacular said, you know, not you. One will definitely die, um, and and here let me make this very clear, readers and consumers of this text and human beings uh, yet unborn, all human beings are made in my image, says God, uh, and and this is big. the original sin concept. So when, when Christ, Christians who believe in original sin, it generally stems from the Adam and Eve story and Eve, you know, um, eating from the forbidden kind of fruit. So that's where the original sin. So since that's in the um, Hebrew Bible, how, does that just mean that they had to be taught by God or what, how do you, what's that interpretation? I, you know, you guys, you have to see my my notes here because I'm looking at the clock and uh, this is not uncommon, by the way, I went, went in Bible study. <clears throat> we'll put it this way. I, I've been studying the book of Samuel uh, before COVID uh, once a week um, with, with a group at the synagogue. And I think we're on our third year of just the book of Samuel. And, and uh, have we even gotten to the second book? I, I don't even know. Uh, so this is so common. It's so rich. But uh, on my notes here, uh, I actually have uh, among some of my favorite things, uh, the story of the Garden of Eden. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt on that one just because of the time. Um, but if you hold my feet to the fire, I'll come back to you on that. And uh, when I say these are some of my favorite things, God knows you have some of your favorite things with regard to uh, the Christian Bible, uh, the New Testament, the Old Testament, um, but that's uh, an ongoing discussion. Uh, if uh, in the future, uh, God willing, uh, we'll, we'll pick up from where we left off and uh, go through some of what I, I, I and, and, and it, it's so I don't know. It, it, these are just some, some, I, uh, uh, some texts that 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 I am so deeply involved with and intrigued by. Uh, but that was the third one uh, to discuss. I, I have, um, I had nine uh, verses prepared, and I knew at the gate that uh, uh, we wouldn't get to all of that material over prepared. Um, you should have just you should just read them all out, just in one step. So uh, I wanted to. Um, uh, as I, I, I said, um, beginnings, uh, Breshit bara, uh, the very opening line, uh, B'Tselem Elohim, uh, God uh, makes human beings. Uh, and I wanted to speak about uh, the Garden of Eden as understood as the metaphor, but specifically uh, the fiery um, uh, seraph, seraphim in Hebrew, um, you know, at the, at, at the, at, at the, uh, exit point of the gate where God sets up these mythic creatures who are uh, twirling these fiery swords, um, it, which is so powerful. Um, I wanted to also touch on uh, Noah and um, uh, where the text says, uh, uh, Noah east Sadiq Bedoro Tab, that he was a good man relative to his time. And I think that is a very, very important a verse with regard to how we view our parents, our ancestries, our history. Uh, I think too often, I know I am, and perhaps you can agree, 
we become very hard using certain standards of our own aesthetic at the moment uh, to um, look retrospectively through time or even within the context, as I said, of our own family. Uh, I think that's true with historical figures, uh, family and the like. Uh, I wanted to discuss with you and I have as part of my favorite things, after Noah, um, uh, this man who is righteous relative to his time, um, uh, essentially is asked to repopulate the world. What does he do? What's the first thing this guy does? He plants a vineyard and he gets blasted. And I just think that is so remarkable. He gets drunk. Uh, and anyway, um, uh, Abraham uh, at 99 years old, I do believe it's the text metaphoric way of saying, you know what, you're never too old. To, to take on new challenges and to think differently. Um, beautiful, beautiful place after Jacob wakes up from his dream and he says, um, God is in this place. Uh, and I was totally unaware of it, clueless, and how that applies certainly to my life and, and perhaps to yours as well, how things are just staring us in the face and how clueless we often are. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty, pretty uh, powerful. And uh, the last one, um, and I had a few sidebars as well, uh, last section, um, and we can come back to this perhaps in the future, but this, I, I just, and this is all in Genesis, folks. Again, I, I, I'm not, I, 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 I know I'm, uh, I don't, all right, uh, it's enough hyperbole, but anyway, beautiful, beautiful section of Jacob and Esau after 20 years, that's a generation. You know, um, uh, that's a score, as it were, you know, four score and seven, that, 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 that's 20 years, 20 years, twin brothers, twin brothers. It's Esau and Jacob. We say Jacob and Esau. Esau is the firstborn. They come together and they reconcile. And wow, that is earth shaking. Um, so those were just some of the favorite things of, of, uh, that I love about this book we call the Bible. Uh, folks, may I be among the first, um, really uh, from the heart, to wish all of you a blessed Christmas, and uh, God bless each and every one of you. Stay well. Uh, Reverend East, Reverend Carpenter, um, in friendship and uh, tremendous regard and respect to the two of you. Uh, love to all of you guys. Let's stay in touch, and uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, just to uh, debate, discuss, and learn together.